please put your hands together and join me in welcoming our panel and our host, Julie Robner. Hello, good morning, and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and I'm joined by some of the very best and smartest health reporters in Washington, along with some very special guests today. We're taping this special election episode on Thursday, October 17th at 11.30 a.m. in front of a live audience at the Barbara Jordan Conference Center here at KFF in downtown D.C. Say hi, audience. <laughs> As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So here we go. So I am super lucky to work at and have worked at some pretty great places and with some pretty great smart people. And when I started to think about who I wanted to help us break down what this year's elections might mean for health policy, it was pretty easy to assemble an all-star cast. So first, my former colleague from NPR, senior White House correspondent Tamara Keith. Tam, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Next, our regular What the Health podcast panelist and my right hand all year on reproductive health issues, Alice Olstein of Politico. Hi, Julie. Finally, two of my incredible KFF colleagues. Cynthia Cox is a KFF vice president and director of the program on the ACA and one of the nation's very top experts on what we know as Obamacare. Thank you, Cynthia. Great to be here. And finally, Ashley Kersinger is director of survey methodology and associate director of our KFF public opinion and survey research program and my favorite explainer of all things polling. Thanks for having me. So. Welcome to all of you. Thanks again for being here. We're going to chat amongst ourselves for a half hour or so, and then we will open the floor to questions. So be ready here in the room. Um, Tam, I want to start with the big picture. What's the state of the race as of October 17th, both for president and for Congress? OK, well, let's start with the race for president. That's what I cover most closely. This is what you would call a margin of error race. And it has been a margin of error race pretty much the entire time, despite some really dramatic events, like a whole new candidate and two assassination attempts and things that we don't expect to see in our lifetimes, and yet they've happened. And yet it is an incredibly close race. What I would say is that at this exact moment, there seems to have been a slight shift in the average of polls in the direction of former President Trump. He is in a slightly better position than he was before and is in a somewhat more comfortable position than Vice President Harris. She has been running as an underdog the whole time, though there was a time where she didn't feel like an underdog. And right now she is also running like an underdog and the vibes have shifted, if you will. There's been a more dramatic shift in the vibes than there has been in the polls. And the thing that we don't know <laughs> and we, we, will, we won't know until Election Day is in 2016 and 2020, the polls underestimated Trump's support. So at this moment, Harris looks to be in a weaker position against Trump than either Clinton or Biden looked to be. It turns out that the, the polls were underestimating Trump both of those years. But in 2022, after the Dobbs decision, uh, the polls overestimated Republican support and underestimated Democratic support. So what's happening now? We don't know. <laughs> uh, so there you go. There, that is my my overview, I think, of the presidential race. Uh, the campaigning has really intensified in the last week or so, like really intensified, and it's only going to get more intense. I think Harris has gotten a bit darker in her language and descriptions. The joyful warrior has been replaced somewhat by the person warning of dire consequences for democracy. And in terms of the House and the Senate, which will matter a lot, a lot, a lot, whether Trump wins or Harris wins, you know, if Harris wins and Democrats lose the Senate, Harris may not even be able to get cabinet members confirmed. Uh, so it, it matters a lot. And, you know, the conventional wisdom, which, you know, is as useful as it is and sometimes is not all that useful. The conventional wisdom is that something kind of unusual could happen, which is that the House could flip to Democrats and the Senate could flip to Republicans. And usually these things don't move in opposite directions in the same year. 
And usually the presidential candidate has coattails, but we're not really seeing that either, are we? Right. It, it, in fact, it's the reverse. Uh, several of the Senate candidates in key swing states, um, the Democratic candidates are polling much better than the Republican candidates in those races and polling more with greater strength than Harris has in those states. Is this a polling error or is this the return of split ticket voting? I don't know. <laughs> well, leads us to our polling expert. <laughs> Ashley, what are the latest polls telling us and what should we keep in mind about the limitations of polling? I feel like every every year people depend a lot on the polls and every year we say, don't depend too much on the polls. Um, well, can I just steal Tamara's line and say, I don't know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so in really close elections, when turnout is going to matter a lot, what the polls are really good at is telling us what is motivating voters to turn out and why. And so what the polls have been telling us for a while is that the economy is top of mind for voters. Now, healthcare costs, we're at KFF, so healthcare plays a big role in how people think about the economy um, in really two big ways. The first is unexpected costs. So unexpected medical bills, healthcare costs are topping the list of the public's kind of financial worries, things that they're worried about what happened might happen to them or their family members. And putting off care. What we're seeing is about a quarter of the public these days are putting off care because they say they can't afford the cost of getting that needed care. So that really shows the way that the financial burdens are playing heavily on the electorate. What we have seen in recent polling is Harris is doing better on household expenses than Biden did and is better than kind of the Democratic Party largely. And that's really important, especially among black women and Latina voters. We are seeing some movement among those two groups of the electorate saying that Harris is doing a better job and they trust her more on those issues. But historically, if the election is about the economy, Republican candidates do better. They, the party does better on economic issues among the electorate. What we haven't mentioned yet is abortion. And this is the first kind of presidential election since post Dobbs in the post Dobbs era. And we don't know how abortion policy will play in a presidential election. It hasn't happened before. So that's something that we're also keeping an eye on. We know that Harris's campaigning around reproductive rights is working among a key group of the electorate, especially younger women voters. She is seen as a genuine candidate who can talk about these issues and an advocate for reproductive rights. We're seeing abortion rise in importance as a voting issue among young women voters. And she's seen as more authentic on this issue than Biden was. Um, yeah, talk about last week's poll about young women voters. Yeah, one of the great things that we can do in polling is when we see big changes in the campaign, is we can go back to our polls and the respondents and ask how things have changed them. So we worked on a poll of women voters back in June. Lots have changed since June. So we went back to them in September to see how things were changing for this one group, right? So we went back to the same people and we saw increased motivation to turn out, especially among Democratic women. Republican women were about the same level of motivation. Um, they're more enthusiastic and satisfied about their candidate. And they're more likely to say abortion is a major reason why they're gonna be turning out. But we still don't know how that will play across the electorate in all the states. Because for most voters, a candidate's stance on abortion policy is just one of many factors that they're weighing when it comes to turnout. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at as well. I will say that I'm not a forecaster, thank goodness. I'm a pollster and polls are not good at forecasts, right? So polls are very good at giving a snapshot of the electorate at a moment in time. So two weeks out, that's what I know from the polls. What will happen in the next two weeks? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alice, just to pick up on that, um, abortion and reproductive health writ large are by far the biggest health issues in this campaign. What impact is it having on the presidential race and the congressional races and the ballot issues. It's all kind of a clutter, isn't it? Yeah, well, I just really want to stress what Ashley said about this being uncharted territory. So we can gather some clues from the past few years where we've seen these abortion rights ballot measures 
win decisively in very red states and very blue states and very purple states. But presidential election years just have a different electorate. And so, yes, it did motivate more people to turn out in those, you know, midterm and off year elections. But that that's just not the same group of folks. And it's not the same groups the candidates need this time necessarily. And also, we know that every time abortion has been on the ballot, it has won. But the impact and how that spills over into partisan races has been a real mixed bag. So, you know, we saw in Michigan in 2022, it really helped Democrats. It helped Governor Gretchen Whitmer. It helped Michigan Democrats take back control of the state house for the first time in decades. But that didn't work for Democrats in all states. Um, my colleagues and I did an analysis of a bunch of different states that had these ballot measures, and these ballot measures largely succeeded because of Republican voters who voted for the ballot initiative and voted for Republican candidates. And that might seem contradictory. You know, you're voting for an abortion rights measure and you're voting for very anti-abortion candidates. We saw that in Kentucky, for example, where, you know, a lot of people voted for Rand Paul, who is very anti-abortion, and for the abortion rights side of the ballot measure. I've been on the road uh, the last few months, and I think you're going to see a lot of that again. I just got back from Arizona, and a lot of people are planning to vote for the abortion rights measure there and for candidates who have a record of opposing abortion rights. Part of that is Donald Trump's you know, somewhat recent line of, you know, I won't do any kind of national ban, I'll leave it to the states. That, you know, a lot of people are believing that, even though Democrats are like, don't believe him, it's not true. But also, like Ashley said, folks are just prioritizing other issues. And so, yes, when you look at, you know, certain slices of the electorate, like young women, abortion is a top motivating issue. But when you look at the entire electorate, it's like a distant fourth after the economy and immigration and several other things. I found the KFF polling really illuminating in that, yes, you know, most people said that abortion is either just one of many factors in deciding their vote on the candidates or not a factor at all. And most people said that they would be willing to vote for a candidate who does not share their views on abortion. So I think that's really key here. And, you know, these abortion rights ballot measures, the campaigns behind them are being really deliberate about remaining completely nonpartisan. They need to appeal to Republicans, Democrats, independents in order to pass. But that also, you know, so their motivation is to appeal to everyone. Democrats' motivation is to say, you have to vote for us too. Abortion rights won't be protected if you just pass the ballot measure. You also have to vote for Democrats up and down the ballot because they argue Trump could pursue a national ban that would override the state protections. We've seen in the past, and this is for both of you, um, ballot measures as part of partisan strategies. Um, in the early 2000s, there were sort of anti-gay marriage ballot measures that were intended to pull out Republicans, that were intended to drive turnout. That's not exactly what's happening this time, is it? Yeah, so I was a reporter in the great state of Ohio in 2004, and there was a an anti-gay rights ballot measure on, on the ballot there. And it was a key part of George W. Bush's reelection plan. And it worked. He won the state somewhat narrowly. We didn't get the results until 5 a.m. the next day. But, you know, that's better than we'll likely have this time. And that was a critical part of driving Republican turnout. It's remarkable how much has changed since then in terms of public views. It, it wouldn't work in the same way this time. The interesting thing in Arizona, for instance, is that there's also an anti-immigration ballot measure that's also polling really well um, that was added by the legislature uh, in sort of a rush to try to offset the expected uh, Democratic base turnout because of the abortion measure. But as you say, it, it is entirely possible that there could be a lot of Trump, abortion, immigration, and Ruben Gallego voters. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I, I met some of those voters. And, you know, one woman told me, look, you know, she gets offended when people assume that she's liberal because she identified as pro-choice. You know, we don't use that terminology in our reporting, but um, she identified as pro-choice and she was saying, look, to me, this is a very conservative value. I don't want the government in my personal business. I believe in privacy. Uh, and so for her, that doesn't translate over into and therefore I am a Democrat. 
I covered two uh, abortion-related ballot measures in South Dakota that were two years, I think it was 2006 and 2008. And they have another one this year. <laughs> right, yeah, there is another one this year. But what was interesting, what I discovered in 2006 and 2008 is as exactly what you were saying, that there's a libertarian streak, particularly in the West, of people who vote Republican, but who don't believe that the government has any sort of business in your personal life, not just on abortion, but on any number of other things, including guns. Um, so this is one of those issues where there's sort of a lot of uh, distinction. Um, Cynthia, this is the first time in however many elections the Affordable Care Act has not been a huge issue. Um, but there's a awful lot at stake for this law, depending on who gets elected, right? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, it's the first time in recent memory that health care in general, aside from abortion, hasn't really been the main topic of conversation in, in the race. And part of that is that the Affordable Care Act has really transformed uh, the American health care system over the last decade or so. Um, the uninsured rate is at a record low, and you know the, the ACA marketplaces, um, which had been really struggling 10 years ago, have started to not just survive, but thrive. You know, maybe also less to dislike about the ACA, but it's also not as much a, a policy election, you know, as previous elections had been. But yes, the future of the ACA is still hinges on this election. So starting with President Trump, I think as anyone who follows health policy knows or even politics or just turned on the TV in 2016 knows that Trump has a very, very clear history of opposing the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, he supported a number of efforts in Congress to try to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And when those weren't successful, he took a number of regulatory steps, joined legal challenges, and proposed in his budgets to slash funding for the Affordable Care Act and for Medicaid. But now in 2024, it's a little bit less clear exactly where he's going. I would say earlier in the 2024 presidential cycle, he made some very clear comments about uh, saying Obamacare sucks, for example, or that, um, you know, that Republicans should never give up on trying to repeal and replace the ACA, that the failure to do so when he was president was a low point for the party. Um, but then he also has seemed to kind of walk that back a little bit. Um, you know, now he's saying that he would replace the ACA with something better better or that he would make the ACA itself much, much better or make it cost less. But he's not providing specifics. Of course, in the debate, he famously said that he had concepts of a plan, um, but there's no, uh, you know, nothing really specific has materialized. We, we haven't seen any of those concepts, Yes, the right? concept is, um, but we can look at his record. And so we do know that, um, you know, he has a very, very clear record of opposing the ACA and, and really taking any steps he could when he was president to try to, you know, if not repeal and replace it, then significantly weaken it or roll it back. Harris, by contrast, is in favor of the Affordable Care Act. When she was a primary candidate in 2020, she had expressed you know, support for more progressive reforms like Medicare for All or Medicare for More. But since becoming vice president, and especially now as the um, presidential candidate, she's taken a more incremental approach. You know, She's talking about building upon the Affordable Care Act. In particular, a key aspect of her record and Biden's is these enhanced subsidies that exist in the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. They were First, I think, you know, they really closely mirror what Biden had run on as president um, in 2019, 2020, but they were passed as part of COVID relief. So they were temporary. Then they were extended as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, but again, temporarily. And so they're set to expire next year, which is setting up a political showdown of sorts for Republicans and Democrats on the Hill about whether or not to extend them. And Harris would like to make these subsidies permanent because they have been responsible for really transforming the ACA marketplaces. The, the number of people signing up for coverage has doubled since Biden took office. Um, premium payments were cut almost in half. And so, you know, this is, I think, a key part of now her record, but also what she wants to see go forward. But it's going to be an uphill battle, I think, uh, to extend them. Cynthia, to sort of build on that a little bit, um, as we mentioned earlier, a Democratic president won't be able to get a lot accomplished with a Republican House and or Senate, and a Republican president won't be able to get that much done with a Democratic House and or Senate. Um, what are some of the things we might expect to see if either side wins a trifecta, control of the executive branch and both houses of Congress? So I think... There, so I guess we'll start with Republicans. So if there is a trifecta, um, the key thing there to keep in mind is while there may not be a lot of 
appetite in Congress to try to repeal and replace the ACA since that wasn't really a winning issue in 2017. And since then, public support for the ACA has grown. And and I think also it's worth noting that the individual mandate penalty being re reduced to zero dollars. So if essentially there's no individual mandate anymore. There's less to hate about the law. Um, so All the pay-fors are gone. Too. Yeah, the pay-fors are gone. So the too. lobbyists have less to hate. Yes, that uh, too. Um, and so, you know, I don't think there's a ton of appetite for this, even though Trump has been, you know, saying still some, you know, negative comments about the ACA. That being said, if Republicans want to pass, um, you know, tax cuts, then they need to find savings somewhere. And so, you know, that could be in any, any number of places, but I think it's, it's likely that certain health programs and other programs are off limits. So Medicare probably wouldn't be touched, maybe Social Security, Defense, but that leaves Medicaid and the ACA subsidies. And so if they need savings to, in order to pass tax cuts, then I do think in particular Medicaid is at risk, not just rolling back the ACA's Medicaid expansion, but also likely block granting the program or implementing per capita caps or some other form of really restricting the amount of federal dollars that are going towards Medicaid. And this is kind of where we get into the, the project 2025 that, that we've talked about a lot on the podcast um, over the course of this year that, of course, Donald Trump has has disavowed. But apparently J.D. Vance has not because he keeps mentioning and pieces they're of it. Only, they're just one of several groups that have pitched, you know, uh, deep cuts to health safety net programs, including Medicaid. You also have the Paragon Group, where a lot of former Trump officials are putting forward health policy pitches and um, and several others. And so I also think, given the uncertainty about a trifecta, it's also worth keeping in mind, you know, what they could do through waivers and executive actions in terms of work requirements. That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had trouble sort of explaining this. I've done a bunch of interviews in the last couple of weeks to explain explain how much more power Donald Trump would have if he was reelected to do things via the executive branch than a President Harris would have. So I have not come up with a good way to explain that. Please, one of you, <laughs> give, it, give it a else. shot. Why is it, why is it that President Trump could probably do a lot more with his executive power than a President Harris could do with hers? I, th I think we can look back at the last few years and just see, you know, what did Trump do with his executive power? What did Biden do with his executive power? And, um, you know, as far as the Affordable Care Act is concerned or, or Medicaid, but Trump after the failure to repeal and replace the ACA took a number of regulatory steps, um, you know, for example, trying to expand short term plans, which are not ACA compliant and therefore can discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions or cutting funding for certain things um, in the ACA, including outreach and enrollment assistance. And so, you know, I think there, there were a number and, and also we've talked about Medicaid work requirements in, in the form of state waivers. And a lot of what Biden did, regulatory actions, were like just rolling that back, you know, changing that. But it's it's hard to expand coverage or to provide a new program without Congress acting to to authorize that spending. I think it's also really important to think about um, the public's view of the ACA at this point in time. I mean, what the polls aren't mixed about is the 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 ACA has higher favorability than Harris, Biden, Trump, any politician, right? So we have about two thirds of the public. That so Nancy Pelosi was right. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go that far. But uh, <laughs> uh, about two thirds of the publics now um, view the, the law favorably. And the provisions are even more popular. So we'll, while yes, a Republican trifecta will have a lot of power, um, the public it, they're going to have a hard time rolling back protections for people with pre-existing conditions, which are popular, have bipartisan support. Um, they're going to have a hard time um, making it um, no longer available for uh, adult children under the age of uh, 26 to be on their parents' health insurance. All of those components of the ACA are really popular. And once people are given protections, it's really hard to take them away. Although I would say that there are at least 10 ways the ACA protects people with pre-existing conditions. I think like on the surface, it's easy to say that you would protect people with pre-existing conditions if you say that a health insurer has to, you know, offer coverage to someone with a pre-existing condition. But there's all those other ways that the ACA also protects pre-existing conditions. And it makes coverage more comprehensive, which makes coverage more expensive. And so that's why the subsidies there are key to make comprehensive coverage that protects people with pre-existing conditions affordable to individuals 
Uh, but if you take those subsidies away, then um, it that that coverage is out of reach for and most that, people. And that's also what J.D. Vance was talking about with changing risk pools. I mean, which most people, it makes your eyes glaze over, but that would be super important to the affordability of insurance, right? Yeah. So, and his comment about risk pools is, I, I think a lot of people were trying to read something into that because it, it was pretty vague. But what a lot of people did think about when he made that comment was that before the Affordable Care Act, it used to be that if you were declined health insurance coverage, you know, especially by multiple insurance companies, if you were basically uninsurable, then you could apply to in what existed in many states was a high risk pool. But the, the problem was that these high-risk pools were consistently underfunded. And in most of those high-risk pools, there were even, you know, waiting periods or exclusions on coverage for pre-existing conditions or, um, you know, very high premiums or deductibles. So even though these were theoretically an option for coverage for people with pre-existing conditions before the ACA, the lack of funding or support made it such that that coverage didn't work very well for people who were sick. And something conservatives really want to do if they gain power is go after the Medicaid expansion. They've sort of set up this dichotomy of sort of the deserving and undeserving. They don't say it in those words, but they argue that childless adults who are able-bodied don't need this safety net the way sort of quote-unquote traditional Medicaid enrollees do. And so they want to go after that part of the program by reducing the federal match. That's something I would watch out for. I don't know if they'll be able to do that. That would require Congress. But also, several states have in their laws that if the federal match is decreased, they would automatically unexpand, and that would mean coverage losses for a lot of people. That would be very politically unpopular. And, you know, it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of states, mainly red states, have expanded Medicaid since Republicans last tried to go after the Affordable Care Act in 2017. And so there's there's just a lot more buy-in now. So it would be politically more challenging to do that. And it was already very politically challenging. They weren't able to do it uh, back then. So I feel like one of the reasons that Trump might be able to get more done than Harris just using executive authority is the makeup of the judiciary, which has been very conservative, particularly at the Supreme Court. And we actually have some breaking news on this. Yesterday, the th three of the states who intervened in what was originally a Texas lawsuit trying to revoke the FDA's approval of the abortion pill Mifepristone officially revived that lawsuit, which the Supreme Court had dismissed because the doctors who filed it initially didn't have standing, according to the Supreme Court. The states want the courts to invoke the Comstock Act, an 1873 anti-vice law banning the mailing and receiving of, among other things, anything used in an abortion, to effectively ban the drug. This is one of those ways that Trump wouldn't even have to lift a finger to bring about an abortion ban, right? I mean, he'd just have to let it happen. Right. I think, you know, so much of this election cycle has been dominated by, would you sign a ban? And that's just the wrong question. I mean, we've seen Congress unable to pass either abortion restrictions or abortion protections, even when one party controls both chambers. It's just really hard. And going back <laughs> 50, 60 years. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and so I think it's way more important to look at what could happen administratively or through the courts. And so, yes, you know, lawsuits like that, that the Supreme Court punted on but didn't totally resolve this term uh, could absolutely come back. A Trump administration could also direct the FDA to just unauthorized abortion pills, which are, you know, the majority of abortions that take place within the U.S. And so there, there are, you know, or there's this Comstock Act route. There's the Biden administration put out a memo saying, you know, we do not think the Comstock Act applies to the mailing of abortion pills to patients. A Trump administration could put out their own memo and say, we believe the opposite. Um, so there's a lot that could happen. And so I, I really have been frustrated. All of the obsessive focus on would you sign a ban? Would you veto a ban? Because that is... Uh, the least likely route that this would happen. Well, and all of these court cases create an air of confusion among the public, right? And so that also can have an effect in a way that, you know, signing a ban, right? It's like, I mean, if people don't know what's available to them in their state, based on state policy or national policy. Or they're afraid of getting arrested. Yeah, even if it's completely legal in their state, we're finding that people aren't aware of whether what's available to them in their state, what they can access legally or not. And so having those court cases pending creates this air of confusion among the public. Well, I just to amplify the air of confusion, talking to Democrats who watch focus groups, they saw a lot of voters 
blaming President Biden for the Dobbs decision and saying, well, why couldn't he fix that? He's president. At a much higher level, there, there is confusion about how our laws work. There are, there's a lot of confusion about civics. And as a result, you see blame landing in sort of unexpected places. This is the vaguest presidential election I have ever covered. <laughs> I've, been, I've been doing this since 1988. Um, we basically have both candidates refusing to answer specific <laughs> questions um, as a strategy. I mean, as a, as a, it's not that, it's not that I don't think, I think they both would have a pretty good idea of what it is they would do. And both of them find it to their political advantage not to say. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that uh, the Harris campaign, which I spend more time covering, has the view that if Trump is not going to answer questions directly and he is going to talk about concepts of a plan and he's just going to sort of like, well, if I was president, this wouldn't be a problem, so I'm not going to answer your question, which is his answer to almost every question, then there's not a lot of upside for them to get into great specifics about policy and to have like think tank nerds telling them it won't work because <laughs> because like there's no upside to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're right here. <laughs> so Regular listeners of, to the podcast will know that one of my biggest personal frustrations with this campaign is the ever-increasing amount of mis- and outright disinformation in the healthcare realm, as we discussed at some length on last week's podcast. You can go back and listen. This has become firmly established in public health, obviously pushed along by the divide over the COVID pandemic. Uh, the New York Times last week had a pretty scary story by Cheryl Gay Stolberg, who's working on a book about public health, about how some of these more fringe beliefs are getting embedded in the mainstream of the Republican Party. It used to be that we saw most of these kind of fringe anti-science, anti-health beliefs were on the far right and on the far left, and that's less the case. Um, what could we be looking forward to on the public health front if Trump is returned to power, particularly with the help of anti-vaccine activist and now Trump endorser RFK Jr.? Oh, goodness to me. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, so I'm going to talk about a group that I think is really important for us to focus on when we think about misinformation, and I call them the malleable middle. So it's that group that once they hear misinformation or disinformation, they are unsure of whether that is true or false, right? So they're stuck in this uncertainty of what to believe and who do they trust to get the right information. It used to be pre-pandemic that they would trust their government officials. Uh, we have seen declining trust in CDC, all levels of public health officials. Um, who they still trust is their primary care providers. Unfortunately, the groups that are most susceptible to misinformation are also the groups that are less likely to have a primary care provider. So we're not in a great scenario where we're, we're, we have a group that is unsure of who to trust on information and doesn't have someone to go to for good sources of information. I don't have a solution. <laughs> <laughs> I also don't have a solution. Um, no, I, I wasn't. But, at, the question isn't about a solution. The question is about what can we expect? I mean, we've seen the sort of mis and disinformation. Are we going to actually see it embedded in policy? I mean, we've mostly we've mostly not, um, you know, other than COVID, which obviously now we see the, the big difference in some states where, you know, mask bans are banned and, you know, vaccine mandates are banned. Are we going to see, you know, childhood vaccines made voluntary for school? Well, there's already a movement to massively broaden who can apply for an exception to those. And that's already had <laughs> um, some scary public health consequences. And so, I, I mean, I think there are people who would absolutely push for that. I think regardless of who wins the presidency, I think that the misinformation and disinformation is going to have an increasing role. Whether it makes it into policy will depend on who is in office and Congress and all of that. But I think that it is not something that's going away. And I think we're just going to continue to have to battle it. And that's where I'm, I'm the most nervous. Yeah, and when you talk about the trust for the media, those of us who are sitting here trying to, uh, you know, get the truth out there or to fact check and debunk trust for us is like 
in the basement. And it just keeps getting worse year after year after year. And, you know, the latest Gallup numbers have us worse than we were before, which is just like another institution that people are not turning to. You know, we are in an era where some rando on YouTube who said they did their research is more trusted than what we publish. And some of those randos on YouTube have millions of viewers, oh, listeners, yes, absolutely. subscribers, whatever you want to call them. I, and, you know, one area where I've really seen this come forward and it could definitely become part of policy in the future is there's a, just a lot of mis- and disinformation around transgender health care. There are there's polling that show a lot of people believe, you know, what Trump and others have been saying that, oh, kids can come home from school and have, you know, a sex change operation, which is obviously ridiculous. Everyone who has kids in school knows that they can't even give them a Tylenol without parental permission. And it obviously doesn't happen in a day. Um, And so, but, you know, people are like, oh, well, I know it's not happening at my school, but it's sure happening somewhere. Um, And, you know, that that's really resonating. And we're already seeing a lot of legal restrictions on that front spilling. All right, well, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, Please wait to ask your question until you have a microphone so the people who will be listening to the podcast uh, will be able to hear your question. And please tell us who you are, and please make your question a question. Hi, I'm Magdalene. I am a grad student at the Milton Institute of Public Health at George Washington. Um, My question is regarding polling, and I was just wondering how has polling methodologies or tendencies to oversample conservatives had on polls in the race? Like, are you seeing that as an issue or? Okay, um, you, you know who's um, less trusted than the media? It's pollsters, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm, you can trust me. So um, I think what you're seeing is there are now more polls than they've ever been. And I wanna talk about legitimate scientific polls that are probability-based, They're not letting people opt in to taking the survey, and they're making sure their samples are representative of the entire population that they're surveying, whether it be the electorate or the American public, depending on that. I think what we have seen is that there have been some tendencies when people don't like the poll results, they look at the makeup of that sample and say, oh, this this poll's too Democratic or too conservative, has too many Trump voters, or whatever it may be. That benefits no pollster to make their sample not look like the population that they're they're aiming to represent. And so, yes, there are lots of really, really bad polls out there, but the, the ones that are legitimate and scientific are still striving to aim to make sure that it's representative. The problem with election polls is we don't know who the electorate's going to be. We don't know if Democrats are going to turn out more than Republicans. We don't know if we're going to see higher shares of rural voters than we saw in 2022. We don't know. And so that's that's where you really see the shifts in error happen. Well, and if former President Trump's big part of his strategy is turning out unlikely voters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, then- <laughs> we have no idea who they are. Well, yeah, and, you know, we saw in Georgia the sort of their first day of in-person early voting. We had this huge upswell of voters, but we have no idea who any of those are, right? I mean, we don't know that they, that whether, we don't know what is necessarily turning them out. Exactly. And historically, you know, Democrats have been more likely to vote early and to vote by mail, but that has really shifted since the pandemic. And so you see these day voting totals now, but that, I, that really doesn't tell you anything at this point in the race. <laughs> Lots we still don't know. Another question? Hi there, Ray Woods. I'm with Advisory Board, which means that I work with health leaders who need to implement based on the policies and the politics and the results of the election that's coming up. My question is, outside some of the big things that we've talked about so far today, are there some more specific smaller policies or state level dynamics that you think today's health leaders will need to respond to in the next six months, the next eight months? What do health leaders need to be focused on right now based on what could change most quickly? Something I've been trying to shine a light on are state Supreme Courts, uh, which the makeup of them could change dramatically this November. States have all kinds of different ways to, you know, some elect them on a partisan basis, some elect them on a nonpartisan basis, some have, you know, uh, appointments by the governor, but then they have to run in these retention elections. So, but 
they are going to just have so much power over, I mean, I, I'm most focused on how it could impact abortion rights, but they just have so much power on so many things. And given the high likelihood of divided federal government, I think just a ton of health policy is going to happen at the state level. And so I would say the electorate often overlooks those races. There's a huge drop off. You know, a lot of people just vote the top of the ticket and then just leave those races blank. But yes, I think we should all be paying more attention to state Supreme Court races. I think the other thing that we didn't, that nobody mentioned, we were talking about, you know, what the next president could do uh, is the impact of the change to the regulatory um, uh, environment and, and what the sort of the, the Supreme Court's decision um, overturning Chevron is going to have on the next president, um, which, in, in, and we did a whole episode on this, so I can, I can link back to that um, for, for those who don't know. But basically, the Supreme Court has made it more difficult for whoever becomes president next time to um, change rules via their executive authority and put more onus back on Congress. And we will see how that all play, plays out. But I think that's going to be really important next year. Hi, my name is Natalie Burkut. I'm also a master's student at uh, George Washington. I study health policy. I wanted to know a little bit more about, obviously, abortion rights, a huge issue on the ballot in this election, but a little bit more about IVF, which I feel like has kind of come to the forefront a little bit more, both in state races, but also candidates making comments on, on a national level. Um, especially you folks who have been like out in the field and interacting with voters. Is that something that more people are coming out to the ballot for or people who are maybe voting split ticket but in support of IVF but for a Republican candidate? Yeah, that's been fascinating. And so most folks know that this really exploded into the public consciousness um, earlier this year when the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are people legally um, under the state's abortion ban. And that disrupted IVF services temporarily until the state legislature swooped in. So Democrats' argument is that because of these anti-abortion laws in lots of different states that were made possible by the Dobbs decision, Lots of states could become the next Alabama. Republicans are saying, oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, Alabama was solved and no other state's going to do it. Um, but they could. <laughs> Alabama could become the next Alabama. Alabama could certainly become the next Alabama. Um, but I mean, tons of states have very similar language in their laws um, that, that would make that possible. Even as you see a lot of Republicans right now saying, oh, Republicans are, we're, we're pro-IVF, we're pro-family, we're pro-babies, um, there are a lot of divisions on the right <laughs> around IVF, including some who, who do want to prohibit it and others who want to, you know, restrict the way it's pract most commonly practiced in the U.S. where excess embryos are created and only the most viable ones are, are implanted and, and the others are discarded. And so I think this will continue to be a huge fight a lot of activists on in the anti-abortion movement are really upset about how Republican candidates and officials have rushed to defend IVF and promise not to do anything to restrict it. And so I think that's going to continue to be a huge fight no matter what happens. Tam, are you seeing um, discussion about the threats to contraception? I know this is something that Democratic candidates are pushing and Republican candidates are saying, oh, no, that's silly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Democratic candidates are certainly talking about it. I think that uh, because of that IVF situation in Alabama, because of concerns that it could move to contraception, I think Democrats have been able to talk about reproductive health care in a more expansive way and in a way that is perhaps more comfortable than just talking about abortion in a way that's more comfortable to voters and that they're talking to is more, you know, back when Joe Biden was running for president, you know, immediately when Dobbs happened, he was like, and this could affect contraception and it could affect uh, gay rights. And and like Biden seemed much more comfortable in that realm. Um, and so yeah, Biden, who waited, I think it was a year and a half to before say he the, said word the word abortion. abortion. Yes. yes, there was a website like has has Biden <laughs> said abortion yet? Yeah. Essentially, what I'm saying is that there is this more expansive conversation about reproductive health care and reproductive freedom than there had been when Roe was in place. And it was really just a debate about abortion. Actually, do, do, do people, particularly women voters, perceive that there's a real threat to contraception? I think what Tamara was saying about when Biden was the candidate, I do think that that was part of the larger conversation, that larger threat. And so they were more worried about IVF and contraception access during that. When you ask 
voters, whether they're worried about this, they're not as worried, but they do give the Democratic Party in Harris a much stronger advantage on these issues. And so if you were to be motivated by that, you would be motivated to vote for Harris. But it really isn't resonating with women voters in the way now that abortion, abortion access is resonating for Basically, them. Basically, it won't be resonating until they take it away. Exactly. I mean, if I think the Alabama Supreme Court ruling happened yesterday, I think it would be a much bigger issue in the campaign. But, the, you know, all of this is timing. Well, and people really talked about a believability gap around the Dobbs decision, even though the activists who were following it closely were screaming that Roe is toast. <laughs> From the moment the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case, and especially after they heard the case and, you know, people heard the, the tone of the arguments, and then, of course, the decision leaked. And even then there was a believability gap. And until it was actually gone, a lot of people just didn't think that was possible. And I think you're seeing that again around the idea of a national ban. And you're seeing it around the idea of restrictions on contraception and IVF. There's still this believability gap, despite, you know, the evidence we've seen. All right. I think you have time for one more question. Hi, uh, my name's Meg. I'm a freelance writer. And I wanted to ask you about something I'm not hearing about this election cycle. And that's guns. Where do um, shootings and school shootings and gun violence fit into this conversation? I think that we have heard a fair bit about guns. It's part of a laundry list, I guess you could say. Like in the Kamala Harris stump speech, she talks about freedom. She talks about reproductive freedom. She talks about freedom from being shot, going to the grocery store or at school. That's where it fits into her stump speech. And certainly in terms of Trump, he is very pro Second Amendment and um, has at times commented on the school shootings in ways that come across as insensitive. But for his base, and he is only running for his base, for his base being very strongly pro Second Amendment is is critical. And I, I think there was even a question maybe in the Univision town hall yesterday to him about guns. It is not the issue in this campaign, but it is certainly an issue. If we talk about how much politics have changed in a relatively short period of time, to have a Democratic nominee leaning in on restrictions on guns is a pretty big shift. When Hillary Clinton did it, it was like, oh, gosh, she's going there. She lost. Um, I don't think that's why she lost, but certainly the NRA spent a lot of money to help her lose. Biden, obviously an author of the assault weapons ban, was very much in that realm. And Harris has continued moving uh, in that direction along with him, uh, though also hilariously saying she has a Glock. Yeah. <laughs> and she'd be willing to use it. And emphasizing and shot it. Walls is and, and, hunting. Yeah. And like, oh, look, yeah. Tim Walls, he's pheasant hunting this weekend. Um, and unlike John Kerry, he looked like he'd done it before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, John, yeah, John yeah, Kerry there, rather famously went out hunting and uh, clearly and I, had not <laughs> yeah, I was at a rally in 2004 where John Kerry was wearing like the the jacket, the barn jacket and like the the senator, the Democratic senator from Ohio, like hands him a shotgun and he's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was taken back when Harris said that she had a Glock. I thought that was a very interesting response for a Democratic presidential candidate. I do think it is maybe part of her appeal to independent voters that as a gun owner, I support Second Amendment rights, but with limitations. And I do think that that part of appeal it could work for a more moderate voting block on gun rights. We haven't seen this sort of responsible gun owner uh, faction in a long time. I mean, that was the origin of the NRA. But then more recently, Giffords has really taken on that mantle as, you know, we own guns, but we want controls. All right. Well, I could go on for a while, but this is all the time we have. I want to thank you all for coming and helping me celebrate my birthday being a health nerd because that's what I do. Uh, we do have cake for those of you in the room. For those of you out in podcast land, as always, if you enjoy the podcast, you could subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru, Francis Ying, and our editor, Emery Hudeman, and our live show coordinator extraordinaire, Stephanie Stapleton, and our entire live show team. Thanks a lot. This takes a lot more work than you realize. As always, you can email us or comment or questions. We're at whatthehealth, all one word, at kff.org. Or you can still find me. I'm at X, at Jay Robner. Tam, where are you on social media? I'm at Tamara Keith NPR. Alice. At Alice Olstein. 
Cynthia? At Cynthia C. Cox. Ashley. At Ashley Kurtzinger. We will be back in your feed next week. Until then, be healthy. <laughs>